when our church was constructed, it was always Father Michael Becker's intention to have the interior decorated, not just white walls, but to have color and additional artwork in addition to the Russian iconography. Um, we couldn't afford it at the time, and more recently we found out that our historic church actually was unpainted for many, many years until the parish could actually afford to decorate the interior. So when Father Brian Park came, he was mindful of the fact that sometimes when uh, parishioners pass away, families want to give a gift uh, that, would, that would contribute something visible to the worship space. And so he wanted to come up with a vision for the interior of the church. And he worked with a firm that he had worked with at a previous parish, uh, Conrad Schmidt out of Wisconsin, to come up with a vision and a design for the interior of our church so that when gifts arise, uh, we would have some idea what we wanted to do um, with that money. Um, it was meant to be a long-term vision. Uh, the vision they came up with was costly and meant to unfold over decades, but providentially, uh, shortly after the vision was completed, um, we had an anonymous donor from outside the parish actually come to us wanting to make a lasting contribution, visible contribution to our worship space. And the very generous gift they gave funded almost the entire vision that Conrad Schmidt had come up with. Um, once the rest of the parish found out about it, uh, they stepped up and contributed additional funds to, uh, to help complete the vision. And we should mention in particular the Carrie Bartle family. Um, Carrie was a professional painter and a parishioner, longtime parishioner here, who had committed to painting the sidewalls and the choir and statuary apps. Unfortunately, he passed away just before the project began, and his family and friends and employees stepped up to complete that work. In order to come up with a vision for our church, Conrad Schmidt uh, spent some time here. They took uh, lots of pictures, um, spent some time learning from Father Park, his vision and his hopes for the space, and then went back to their studios and uh, created a vision. This was kind of a unique project for them because our space uh, already combined so many different styles of sacred art, uh, stained glass, mosaics, and especially the Russian style iconography. So. In addition to bringing a lot more color to the space and a lot more contrast and warmth to the space, um, the design they came up with has several main features that we'd like to talk about. Um, the first is the inscription of the Great Commission around the base of the dome beneath the apostles. Uh, it wraps around the base of the dome and then uh, between the beginning and end of the inscription there are seven crosses representing the seven sacraments. Father Park is also a big fan of scripture verses in uh, the worship space. And so he wanted to incorporate the seven I am statements from John's gospel. And so as you look throughout the church, we have four of those I am statements beneath the four sets of rosary windows um, high up on the walls of our church. Um, beneath the joyful mysteries, we have uh, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life explaining why it is that he came to earth and what his mission here was. Beneath the luminous mysteries, we have the verse, I am the light of the world. Beneath the sorrowful mysteries, we have the verse about uh, the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And then beneath the glorious mysteries, we have the verse, I am the resurrection and the life. The other three I am statements are on the ceiling beams of the church. As you approach the altar to receive Holy Communion, you'll see I am the bread of life. And above the baptismal font in the back of the church, as you enter and exit, you see the final two I am statements. I am the true vine and I am the gate, reminding us to stay connected to Jesus as our means of salvation. We also have along the long beams that run from the back of the church to the front of the church, um, some vine work, and the, the purpose of the vine work or the symbolism behind that is to connect our baptism to the heavenly banquet of the Eucharist at the altar and to draw us forward to the altar. Our church is laid out so that everything points toward the altar and the tabernacle, and these beams and the vine work along them are meant to draw us forward to the altar. Conrad Schmidt finished the pillars throughout the church in a unique way. Uh, we may be the first church in the United States to have used this technique. They used Venetian plaster, which they applied and then polished to make it look like marble. And the bold vertical lines established by the pillars actually make the space seem larger despite the darker color palette. On either side of the statuary apse where the casket is placed during a wake, 
uh, we added two icons of angels. And these angels are meant to represent the heralds of the resurrection from Luke's gospel. In their hands, each of them has a scroll, and the scroll has the Bible verses, why do you seek the living one among the dead? And he is not here, but he has been raised. So those are a beautiful framing element for the area in the church that is used during funerals. We also enhanced the stations of the cross mosaics throughout the church by adding additional color and gold leaf to the bronze frames and to the walls around the stations. In addition to the unique technique used for the pillars using Venetian plaster, uh, Conrad Schmidt also stepped outside their comfort zone by doing most of the stenciling for this work directly on the walls and ceilings of the church using extensive scaffolding throughout the space. Ordinarily, they do their artwork on canvas back at their shop in Wisconsin and then bring it to the site and apply it to the walls and ceiling almost like wallpaper, uh, permanently adhere it to the space. Uh, however, in our case, the scale of the project was so large and their shop space was so limited that they opted to send a larger team uh, to the church and do the stenciling directly on the walls and ceiling. Between October and December of 2023, we did two final icons in the choir apps and in the statuary apps, and they were uh, written by the same iconographers that came and did the original icons in the dome and behind the altar. We invited the Prosopon School of Iconography back to our church from New York to uh, write two additional icons, one in the half dome above the statuary where I'm standing and one in the half dome above the choir. Uh, the icon in the statuary is an icon of the resurrection and it's appropriate because this marble slab in the statuary is where we put caskets when we have a wake here at the church. And so having the resurrection depicted above it is a very hopeful image. The icon is uh, a beautiful, striking image of Jesus as he is breaking down the gates of the underworld, the gates of the uh, land of the dead, and bringing forth the holy souls who had passed away before his coming. And so you see central to the icon a very dynamic Jesus. Uh, he is standing on the gates of the netherworld and scattered throughout uh, the ground in front of him and beneath him are the various pieces of hardware from the gates and the locks as they were burst when, uh, when he opened them. And then on either side of Jesus you see gatherings of people. Um, we talked to the iconographer about who these people are and he said typically in the resurrection icons the people coming from the land of the dead aren't specifically named. They're not named saints. Many of them are meant to be Old Testament figures, but there are certain figures that you can kind of pick out uh, of a resurrection icon. For example, there's a man and a woman kneeling alongside Jesus. Those are typically regarded as Adam and Eve being, uh, being brought out from the land of the dead. Um, on this side of Jesus, there is a gathering of men, many of whom represent Old Testament figures like the Old Testament kings and prophets. So you could look up there and see a couple of figures wearing crowns and assume that maybe they're David or Solomon. But again, the iconographers said they're not named figures. So um, you can look at them and interpret them as Old Testament figures in whatever way you like. But typically there's also a figure that looks like John the Baptist. And if you look up here, you can see there's a figure with kind of wild hair and a wild beard that could be the John the Baptist figure. On the opposite side, there's a group of women also being brought out from the underworld. Uh, and you see, for example, one of them is wearing a crown. Maybe you could think of that image as Bathsheba, David's queen. Um, but the, the real purpose of the image is to show that there were many people uh, from Old Testament times who had passed before Jesus is coming and he's bringing them all forth from the land of the dead. And then on either side of the icon, there are uh, trees with fruit growing on them. And this is meant to call to mind paradise and that Jesus is calling people from the land of the dead into eternity, into paradise, into a beautiful, uh, a beautiful land of eternal life. In the Pentecost icon over the choir, 
we see Mary surrounded by the apostles in the upper room. Mary is central and the largest figure in the icon. And she's holding a white cloth and there are 12 red seeds meant to represent the seeds of the faith that the apostles are receiving and then spreading. Over each of the apostles, you see a tongue of flame like scripture describes. Uh, and those tongues of flame are coming from this dark circle that's kind of central in the very top of the dome. It's dark blue, and that dark blue color has traditionally called to mind the deep mystery, the unknowability of God. And you actually see that dark blue in other places around the church. It's the backdrop to the big Jesus icon in the dome. It's also uh, above the sanctuary, above the uh, tabernacle, with the Holy Spirit proceeding from it. The apostles around Mary, there are 12 of them, but they're not the 12 that you might expect from Scripture exactly. In iconography, it is typical to portray both Peter and Paul in these situations. And so you see Peter to one side of the center and Paul on the other side. Paul would not have been at Pentecost, but received the Holy Spirit from Jesus himself uh, during his conversion on the road to Damascus. Um, the other apostles are not named specifically. Uh, Peter and Paul aren't actually named either, but they appear centrally and appear as Peter and Paul do in most historic icons. The other apostles are arrayed on either side of them, and they don't have a direct one-to-one -one correspondence to the apostles that are named in the dome and the way that they're portrayed in the dome, but definitely meant to represent uh, the rest of the 11 um, at the time of Pentecost. Again, in this icon on either side, you see uh, trees and vines and flowers growing, again calling to mind this interaction between life on earth and the life of God in paradise. 